a large dead cat bounce. We did get that dead cat bounce. However, after a week, and today it's March 25, we believe that um, most of the problems are still there. And uh, we are here to discuss to you the latest updates and the headlines that we believe are going to move the markets and obviously our portfolio. So the end of globalization. BlackRock's uh, Larry Fink just discussed in a shareholder's letter, he oversees $10 trillion. He is arguably larger than Warren Buffett and is basically um, as big as Vanguard, um, the era of index funds. They say that the Russia-Ukraine war is ending globalization. What it simply means is that if you find that the cheapest source would be made in China, if the U.S. and the China are not in good terms, then it's possible that the U.S. will not deal with China and they will not deal their manufacturing facilities in China. So Larry Fink, uh, the chairman of the world's biggest asset manager, said Russia's invasion of Ukraine is now reversing the long-running trend of globalization. We know that globalization uh, is actually simply getting and optimizing where the cheapest products come from, and there used to be friendly policies worldwide. However, um, the polarization, the extremist behavior that we are seeing across society today means that we are in the end of globalization. Um, in summary, what it means is that if you go local, it only means that it's go expensive. So let's take a look as well at what exactly happened overnight. Europe just struck a gas deal with the U.S. as it is seeking to cut their reliance on Russia. We actually said, uh, saw that overnight when the NATO and the U.S. Um, met last night with EU, um, Russia actually allowed EU to still buy gas supplies, uh, natural gas supplies from them but has maintained that all the unfriendly countries should pay Russian rubles. So uh, let's just view first all the things that's been happening and is continuing to happen. Joe Biden is now visiting the Poland um, borders and Ukraine just got um, gained ground. Uh, there is actually more Russians, uh, armies, uh, still missiles happening. So um, the latest I've seen is that at least 185 children are now died, have now uh, passed away, according to their numbers of uh, Ukraine. And we can clearly see that there is no such thing as a ceasefire or an end of a war. We are still tracking a lot of Friday's developments, but uh, just from reading a lot of news, the UK's defense ministry just said Ukraine was just pushing Russian troops back and regaining ground near Kiev. Country's President Zelensky is marking one month since Russia launched their full-scale attack, thanking the country's armed forces, suggesting Moscow may not have launched its invasion if it knew the extent of this war. So um, it's been a month, February 24 to March 25, and the problem is not yet ending. Uh, let's go through a few things. An Indian rupee ruble trade arrangement with Russia may be ready in a week. So we are seeing right now the division of the world, Russia's allies and Russia's enemies. So India's finance ministry, we know that China, India, and Russia continue to remain partners and trade partners. So um, India's finance ministry and the Reserve Bank of India have not commented so far on this mechanism, which will allow Indian exporters to continue business with Russia even after the U.S. sanctions restricted international payment mechanisms. There was talks uh, said by ECB's Christine Lagarde that the uses of Bitcoin has been used for uh, essentially payment of Russian gas. We also believe that Russian ruble has been converted to Bitcoin, as was suggested with several exchange flows and volumes out there. So it was thought before that Bitcoin was going to be used for terroristic attacks. Seems as today, Bitcoin is being used to pay um, Russian oil and gas, which Russia needs. There have been consultations between uh, as to whether how much that is. It is said that it is at least 800 million euros per day uh, that Russia is supplying towards Europe on the gas. There has been a lot of consultations between central bank governor, the finance minister, and banks. 
president of the Federation of Indian Export Organizations. Continued trade with Russia is risking angering Western nations, including U.S., which have imposed sanctions on Moscow for its attack on Ukraine. Putin wants all the Russian, uh, those who are going to pay for Russian gas to get paid via rubles to help the country's Russian ruble, which devalued 100% actually on the day that the U.S. economic sanctions happened. We'll, we'll look at the charts later on to show to you the aftermaths and the continuation of these wars. European countries' dependence on Russian gas has been thrown into the spotlight since Moscow's 524 invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent imposition of Western sanctions aimed at isolating Russia economically. Russia will continue, of course, to supply natural gas in accordance with volumes and prices. However, it only accepts rubles. So Russian gas accounts for some 40% of Europe's total consumption. EU gas imports from Russia fluctuates between 200 to 800 million a day so far this year. So that's a lot. So um, 800, let's just assume a billion euros times 200 days. So that's 200, uh, uh, sorry, 800 million times 200 days. That's about um, 160 billion dollars. In Europe. So that's a huge, uh, you know, that's uh, 160 billion euros is as big as the entire Philippine GDP. The Philippine economy of the, uh, the GDP of the Philippine economy is roughly 250 billion. So this is just Russian oil and gas. To give you just uh, at least an understanding how big this is, 40% of Europe's total consumption relies on Russia, which is not their ally. Let's read through more facts. Russia is seeking payments in rubles for gas sales from unfriendly countries, sending European gas prices soaring on concerns that this would ex exacerbate the energy crunch. European countries' dependence on Russian gas and other exports uh, have been thrown into spotlight. Um, so there. So you're seeing that um, prices of British wool, uh, wholesale gas prices are up around 15 to 20% since Wednesday. Um, let's understand a few things that has uh, happened. Just this week, uh, we've seen a lot of Tesla, Chinese EV makers all raising prices due to rising material costs, which was an inevitable outcome due to rising raw material prices from the likes of lithium to nickel, all metal prices, aluminum, steel, well, everything that uh, has to do with manufacturing automakers. And with rising rifts, we're seeing that from Tesla to BYD, all the, all the automakers have been forced to raise their prices as cost of raw mats continue to shoot up. We're seeing the same thing happen in uh, food manufacturers as well. So we're seeing rising inflation all throughout the sector. Analysts said some low-cost and smaller players will struggle and even be forced to cut the models from their lineup. So we are seeing that actually the smaller you are, um, we know that Tesla and BYD would remain resilient on these. However, this is going to hurt especially the small players out there, specifically Lucid, Rivian. Um, I would argue that Ford and General Motors will also have a problem. Well, essentially, it's going to be a problem for everyone. Uh, in general, we're seeing that Neo X Pevli Auto, which are Chinese auto players that are still small in comparison, uh, will have a harder time on their supply chains. So we are still bearish on XPeng, and we continue to believe that all the Chinese automakers will have bearish fronts. So we'll go to charts later on. The same thing, um, US March good rates are coming higher. So we know that as the Fed uh, has been aggressively raising rates since uh, March 15. Uh, we do believe that there is no chance uh, and a lot of the households in America are scrambling for the fixed rate mortgages since they have been buying houses and real estate. And with uh, financing going up, you can see that uh, trend going up. Every percentage increase means that every American household would end up having to pay more into their mortgage and their house rentals, and it would affect, obviously, your consumer spending. That said, uh, in 2022, uh, it's possible that 4% can rally to about 6%, almost similar rates to about year 2008 financial crisis levels. However, um, the thing is, most of the real estate prices are more expensive today rather than 14 years ago because in 2022, uh, just consider every material and raw material out there. Everyone is suffering. And when we talk about suffering, 
higher metal prices equals higher steel buildings, all of the buildings and all the apartment buildings are expensive to build. When your production costs increase everywhere, uh, good luck, right? As commodities are rising, all the houses obviously are expensive, which means that all the construction builders are having a difficult time. And it's obvious, if you look at KBH, KB Homes, the builder of a lot of homes, Lenar in US, they've already been discussing difficulty in, um, in selling homes and constructing homes. So um, Ray Dalio uh, talked about principles of the world order, the changing world order. And in his studies, and he published a book about this, there's a lot of videos by Ray Dalio. You can just check and Google this yourself. The Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. He discussed the decline, the rise and fall of empires. And in one of his um, tables, he uh, shared something like this. When a company has large debts, it prints money. There's an internal conflict. There's a loss of reserve currency. Weak leadership leads to civil war. I find it difficult, but this is where we currently are. We're in the decline phase for a new order. Printing money, yes, the Fed did that. Internal conflict, you can clearly see Russia, Ukraine, this Cold War, uh, US, China, Russia. So there's a lot of uh, fighting and large forces of um, difficult uh, situation from a geopolitical standpoint. As for the loss of reserve currency, we know that a lot of people are undermining the strength of the dollar. Some people are saying that it should be Bitcoin that should be the world's reserve currency. Other people said that it should be gold. We should go back to reverse uh, um, the dollar hegemony towards the gold standard. And there's the reason why a lot of people are basically putting their money towards the currency they believe the most. We are seeing... Uh, a lot of assets transferring their U.S. dollars towards gold, towards Australian dollar, as well as towards Bitcoin. Some, some, some are, but uh, a lot of people are also um, converting some of their pesos or Philippine peso towards the dollar. So it really depends on country, but a lot of people are losing faith over their country, just as Russian rubles declined. A lot of uh, people know how weak leadership equals weak currency. And um, often as well, uh, you can clearly see that rising food prices leads to worldwide hunger and it leads to social unrest. So social unrest, according to history, leads to recession, a civil war revolution, and then you get a new order. So military, um, that's the type of world that we are seeing. And are the charts agreeing to what we are seeing? Okay, so just right now, we are seeing that after one week rally uh, on China, uh, we've actually been seeing large-scale large declines in Hong Kong. So it happened from Hong Kong, and it's now uh, transferring to the USA. The US-listed Chinese ADRs are now dropping about 9% to 5%. We've seen DD rally from 1 to as high as 4. It's now falling to 3 again. Could it go down to 2? Possible. Yin rallied from 3 to as high as 550. It's now falling to about 450. Can it fall to about 3 again? Can it potentially go to new lows? My answer is potentially either it retests that March 15 low, uh, which would be seen as a capitulation low, or it makes new lows. I think that some names, some Chinese names, are going to be treated as new lows simply because some Americans truly believe that they cannot invest in China either for morality grounds, accounting practices, um, different beliefs, democracies, uh, democracies being curtailed. The point is that a communistic and a democrat and capitalist, all these chaotic uh, world, worldwide policies are rendering too much volatility. And if you simply ask uh, uh, a normal American hedge fund on whether they would put their money into China, I think 70 to 80% of them would say no matter how cheap the valuations are, they still believe that China is uninvestable. I do believe that China is a bipolar market wherein you've got North Pole and South Pole opinions. And when you've got North Pole and South Pole opinions about this market, what you'll clearly see is when it gets overbought, it gets killed. 
when it gets oversold, it is still continuously oversold and it's harder to make money actually in China on the long side. And it's easier to still make money on the short side. In terms of shorting, we have of the we have high views. Uh, I, at least me, I personally have a high conviction view that the Chinese automakers are the best to short Neo X Peng Li Auto. Um, that said, uh, it's sad to say, but a lot of the Chinese companies, especially the technology firms, uh, the Chinese internet firms, I'm talking about Alibaba, JD, Pintuatuo, they're not going to be safe. We saw Tencent JD get killed in the Hong Kong, and I expect them to get killed as well in USA. So I'm expecting more downticks on China, um, and we view any rallies as shorts. This uh, this drop just confirms that uh, short idea about two days ago when we actually um, was considering shorting Chinese stocks. Um, so far, BlackRock, uh, which is Larry Fink, uh, all, almost all the European financials uh, are actually being, uh, there's a lot of hedge funds and mutual funds and passive funds. Most of them, uh, which have Russian exposure, are deemed, you know, as dead cat bounds. Although today, Moscow resumed uh, the Russian exchange with, uh, with an order that they cannot sell. Basically, short selling is not allowed. What happened was, obviously, there was a massive short covering from people who had probably uh, big shorts on Russia. When you have a, a, a country essentially not allowing free markets, then I don't think that there will be liquidity in that market. So eventually, the people will just leave. They'll sell if they can, and then they'll just go towards the markets that they believe free market policies still remain. And so I believe that BlackRock is slowly divesting and continues to divest uh, away from Russia. It just the same as a lot other countries as well are divesting. Uh, they have divested already. Uh, and so we're just really seeing Cold War. No? So economic wars being waged. And this will exacerbate what is already an exacerbated difficulty when it comes to inflation. So although there are that cut bounces now and then we don't see the trend actually changing so yeah so the trend remains your friend in in this case um all the history shares shared to us is that every crisis whether it be the arab gulf crisis um all of them have led to a commodity super cycle boom and a commodity super cycle boom is equivalent to a worldwide inflation which leads to uh, rate hikes and tight monetary policies, which is really equivalent to a potential recession. European financials, we believe this was a dead cut bounce. So from about $15.50 rally to $19.50, gap down, Europe goes down to $18.76. We think that the European financial sector is having a lot of tough difficulty because of the choice, obviously, to sanction Russia. The implication is higher inflation, and a lot of their banks also uh, are obviously cutting ties with Russia for morality reasons. We call them a moral margin call. BHP Billiton had to um, exit their entire uh, Russian stake. Uh, and I think they had to lose $25 billion in the process. We read a lot of European financials lending a lot to Russia, which could potentially be a default. Um, Moody's and I think almost all the S&P 500 Fitch ratings have already considered Russia into a junk, junk status or essentially global pariah status. With that said, uh, we believe that all these European financials are showing us this um, red line. So uh, a breakdown of 1950 shows to us European financials are on the downtick or possibly uh, breaking this lows and potentially going down. Um, going local is actually going expensive. We know that manufacturing facilities right now are being thought again. Um, some are shifting made in Vietnam. It used to be because of the pandemic before, the supply chain problems. But now it's also about the geopolitical tensions. You can clearly see that the U.S. now believes too much on self-sufficiency. And while there still exists Tesla Shanghai, Tesla Giga Berlin, and Giga Texas, at some point in time, you might also see that um, if the US-China Cold War continues because of the Russia-Ukraine war, we will see um, this difficult truth. 
The difficult truth is that globalization has ended, whether you accept it or not. Therefore, expensive prices for a long time equals inflation for a very long time. Good luck to everyone who thinks that inflation is going away. It's not transitory. So pain and reflection will become progress for the world. They're reflecting today about all their energy crisis plans, which made almost every country double, triple, quadruple all their plans towards decarbonization. We saw that materially happen with all the solars getting the green light, all the green energies, including the unprofitable hydrogen-based fuel systems. Jamie Dimon talked about the Marshall Plan towards the entire uh, EU nation last night. Um, he talked about uh, the necessity for the US and the EU to not depend towards the Middle East, the Russia, the Iran, the Venezuelans, and so forth. This painful inflation made them reflect that there is no such thing as a globalized, globalized world. In some ways, I don't know what would happen, but is it likely that Apple's Foxconn, um, which is currently in Taiwan and China, you know, you have to think about the supply chain effects. So higher, uh, higher prices on the chips, semiconductor chips as well is happening right now. Um, evolution is adapting or dying. Either you adapt to the high inflationary prices or you just simply die with it. Uh, the implications of all these inflation is definitely negative towards consumer spending and consumer discretionary. So we have a major short on XLY and want. And we believe that all these rising oil prices and rising food prices is uh, negative to the world. Um, you're seeing Agricultural Producers Fund continuous higher. This uh, super cycle commodity boom is very positive towards DBA, veggie, and RGU. Um, a lot of your uh, um, vegetable producers. We've seen a resurgence in demand towards food security companies like App Harvest, which rose from about $2.75 to $7. Um, we don't think that this is going to end. The business model of vertical farming is likely to come to a real uh, realization and a reflection by worldwide leaders that um, since expensive prices is happening worldwide, a lot of people are thinking that, hey, it's great to be a farmer. So app harvest is going up. We're seeing growth generation go up. A lot of the farming uh, has been going up, right? Farming stocks, uh, ADM. So far, I haven't seen AgriFi move up. But uh, almost all, um, you're seeing all the vegetable producers go up. Archer Daniels Midland, CF Industries, Mosaic, um, John Deere. So we don't really see an end to this uh, food crisis dilemma. And we see food producers uh, being bought on dips. When we talked about the reliance on oil, it was a problem for the world. And that made them double, triple, quadruple down on all their investments towards nuclear plants. So Cameco, which uh, basically owns the largest uranium mine in the world, is going up to all-time highs. We don't think it's going to end anytime soon. These are long sector ideas which have been confirmed and continue to be reiterating by some dips. So CCJ, Eura has been going up. Uranium, been going up trend. DNN, Denison Mines, same thing happening. UR, uh, URG. Your energy, these are uh, uranium. So almost all uh, UEC, Uranium Energy Corp. Um, all the Ukraine-Russian uh, war, uh, of course, added more impetus to invest towards solar industries. And you're seeing that uptrend channel towards TAN, seeing the same thing happen on your clean energy, QCLN and uh, ICLN. So everyone's actually going through these um, investments. Has wind, solar, uh, actually also um, wind energy also has been uh, getting uh, some, some sort of um, uh, love recently. But uh, more on the solars, actually. I've seen some, some, some buyers on Vestas. So Vestas wind systems have been uh, moving up. You can see that um, change since the U Ukrainian invasion. But I think that the world still sees that um, it is quite expensive to invest in solar. That's why most uh, in wind. That's why um, a lot of the investments are going towards uh, solars and nuclear, as well as fuel cell. So hydrogen-based 
businesses, hydrogen. Mm, that's why you're seeing that movement towards F-cell going up. Uh, last night, I think that the move, uh, there was news about the federal legalization of marijuana, which triggered uh, the movement of Sundial uh, going up 30%, that one, uh, 45 cents to 75 cents. But I don't think this is going to be sustainable. So usually this is what you call a short, con a short covering rally. On the, on the event of the news. We've seen that happen in, in the past. So this was uh, November good earnings and then faded away. I believe that good earnings or good news about the sector on um, cannabis is not enough to actually trigger a, a full, full blown reversal. So these are actually news that uh, are triggering um, short covering squeezes, but just a squeeze nonetheless. We still believe that the NASDAQ is at resistance levels, and we're going to discuss these re resistance levels for you. NASDAQ has resistance at 14,673, 15,060, and 15,240. The only reason why the NASDAQ managed to break away from these uh, resistance levels was obviously just Tesla getting a lot of good news uh, recently with, uh, with Hertz and the Giga, Giga Berlin. So NASDAQ right now is still in a downtrend. Try to break out from that downtrend here because of the short covering uh, on the back of the China sentiment bottom around March 15. Uh, that was a, a quick bounce here. Just what happened like here on January 24 and on February 20, Jan 28 and Feb 24. So we are not, um, this is not the first rodeo towards a, a squeeze. That was squeeze one. This is the squeeze two. And so far we have this squeeze three. We believe that that squeeze can still uh, persist towards this area of about 15,200 area. And of course, there's another resistance here at about 15,000. So what would take us from 14.6 to about 15.1, 15.2? We believe it's just short covering. Um, what, what triggered that move last night was NVIDIA. So we got a positive news on NVIDIA, which uh, made it rally, uh, breaking that 270 towards 280. And that was brought about by the partnership of NVIDIA with Intel uh, to try to address the supply chain problems. So two competitors working to find a solution has uh, triggered some buyers to, towards Intel. Nonetheless, I don't think Intel's really going to reverse. It's just in a trading range with 44 and 56. So uh, still, it's in a downtrend. And as for semiconductors, uh, NVIDIA, no matter how great the business is, would continue to have lots of resistance here about 290 and 300. Uh, as for Tesla, we know that Tesla has, has, uh, has good news. Recently, um, we've seen the, the, the fact that obviously they opened the Giga Berlin, which will allow them to produce 500,000 cars and meet their, goal of, um, meet their goals of hitting millions of cars worldwide. So for Tesla, it's a 5% market share to the world uh, when it comes to global market share. Um, when it comes to EVs, of course, they're number one. But there's, there, there still is a ton of uh, question, question marks simply because of the supply chain problems. So I'd say that um, amongst all the EVs, Tesla is in the best position. But it is unlikely still, in my view, to see Tesla hit all-time highs in a world that is grappling with several uh, crises. Crisis, which is uh, brought about by, by the rising inflation predominantly, which leads to historical recessions. So we, we are bearish. Uh, we are con con constantly actually on the short side, not necessarily towards Tesla, but more on the individual automakers that would have a harder time. So as I said, um, our bigger shorts would be XPeng. So rallies of XPeng here at 29 towards 30 plus is still a sell. I believe that uh, these are the easier targets to short XPeng, NEO, Lee Auto. Obviously, um, your other smaller makers in the U.S. have been having harder times delivering and uh, are also raising prices to address the rising cost. You've seen Rivian actually just go down, and we believe it's continued to go down. Think that a 50% sell off, even at $48, is still likely towards Rivian. So Rivian has been disappointing on all their delivery numbers, and um, the valuation is still quite expensive here. So any rise of Rivian continue to short. Lucid, the same thing. Also, um, they've just been producing hundreds, if not uh, just a few thousand vehicles here. So Lucid is uh, a short at 57 upon the lockup period, a short here at 47 on bad earnings, 
shorts further at $30. And we don't see that trend changing up at all. Lucid remains short. So we, we love to short actually the electric vehicle industry, um, especially the smaller automakers. So those are our top pick selling. Lucid, Rivian, Neo X, Pevli Auto. That said, is uh, Tesla's BYD, uh, Tesla and BYD, are they actually immune? Um, we don't see immunity here. Uh, BYD 1211 has also been shorted from 330 to 280 to 255 to 230. We see that path going down with uh, BYD also falling to about $170. Um, with interest rates on the rise, we are seeing all the homemakers, as I said, home builders, having problems. So KB Homes is actually um, still continuously breaking down. Uh, on the earnings front, it was actually uh, uh, a chance to sell it down here. So uh, just a lot of uh, short areas uh, that you are seeing. Overall, I would also say that um, what's been propping up the U.S. market has been Apple. Um, and Berkshire Hathaway actually is hitting all-time highs because of the huge Apple stake. However, as you can see, uh, with production problems on the rise with the Cold War, I'd say that uh, Apple's uh, Foxconn and manufacturing centers in China might actually have tariffs, uh, bigger problems in the future. So I'd say that if Apple has resistance somewhere here about 177, you will somehow see resistance on your NASDAQ, which is um, the QQQs. Where's the QQQ right now standing? Uh, that blistering rally from 320 is now 360. We would we would view limited upside here about 368 and we'll continue to short the NASDAQ uh, with 368 as a resistance for your QQQs. Uh, NASDAQ would be having resistance at 15,000. What else? Um, the S&P 500, obviously. So taking a look at the SPY here, the SPY is uh, nearing resistance levels near to that uh, February 2 areas. And um, we would see that rally at 456, actually um, another resistance to short again. If you are selling at 450, we would view any rally towards 456 as a sell area, selling opportunity. Now we maintain our view that XLY, which is the consumer discretionary sector, is maintaining a rallies to be sold type of event. So we see that rally from 164 to 184 simply as a breather of an oversold condition and with no change really in, uh, in, the, in the realm of um, inflation going away. We see that the average household consumer uh, worldwide is going to have a problem. Big shorts on XLY here at about 184 and 188 if we have to sell again at 188. So what are the biggest uh, problems when it comes to inflation? Uh, we believe all of the dining out companies like the restaurants. So although CMG Chipotle mentioned about um, having the ability to pass on their costs, we don't think that is uh, a very easy assumption on the CEO standpoint. And we are um, shorting every rally of Chipotle. Short on 1950, short on 1850, 1800, 1700. These lower highs are telling us that the downtrend remains in play for CMG. Same thing happening for Domino's Pizza. Some of the restaurants are actually shorts here. Um, you've seen the earnings already having a problem. So we're just actually following fundamentals here uh, on the fact that fundamentals and technicals are both aligned on the short side. So continuously selling off um, these uh, food groups. Same thing for Yum Brands and Yum China. We think that uh, while well, the, the Yum China fell fast because of the delisting problems uh, that's likely uh, still 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 happening uh, between um, US listed Chinese ADRs, we think that Yum China is obviously uh, in a downtrend here with, uh, with, with the same problems as all fast food chains have. Pizza Hut needs to rely on wheat bread uh, when you're doing pizza. So all of that costs are rising as uh, Ukraine, of course, is the agricultural breadbasket of Europe and um, has been exporting that towards Asia. So there, um, even if Russia and China are friends, or I don't know if they're friends or trade partners, whatever you want to call them, I, I still believe that there will be um, huge pass on risks towards the consumers or boycotts or whatsoever. So Yum China will have some problems here. 43 to 48 are tons of resistance still. We're seeing the same thing happening on Yum Brands and even on McDonald's. So we're looking to be uh, a bear on uh, Yum Brands. Also rallies would be shorted. 119 to 122 would be good areas to short. Airbnb, uh, Expedia, Booking. I believe that all the 
travel restrictions obviously have been uh, eased because of the quarantines and the COVID-19 um, you know, lessening worldwide. Nonetheless, we are seeing on the charts phase that um, there continues to be reluctance from investors to pay a high valuation on Airbnb given the risks. So any rallies of Airbnb, 171 towards 180, we think that at 190, these are just opportunities to get uh, get cheap put options for those who are looking into um, hedging their positions in the overall U.S. market, either hedging or actually just really initiating naked shorts towards these companies. So um, let me just go through some of the... Um, Alibaba has already fallen down. BYD has already fallen down. Let's take a look at the pre-markets here. The Chinese stocks are already uh, declining, as we can see. Hotel stocks are also in the extended hours already falling. So Chinese trip.com is falling down very fast, um, 3% down. The airlines aren't falling yet, but uh, I surmise that even Global Jets is going to have some problems. Uh, with, with still, uh, we, we still maintain the view that uh, oil prices will remain to be high, and that would be difficult for each of these companies. Uh, Global Jets uh, is an ETF, so lower highs, lower lows, still pos uh, still a short. So here about $20, uh, a potential resistance further at 22 Any rallies would be considered by us to be shorted. Okay, so um, aside from this sector, uh, reopening stocks are uh, a sell. Um War spend winners, we've seen that happen. Uh, the war spend winners, we continue to remain long towards war spend winners. War spend winners, aka missiles, jets, guns. Basically, it's sad to say this, but yes, we, we believe that more drones would be apparent and more killings and more, um, more war, more defense industries will be bullish. So L3 Harris has been going up. We've seen there is a drone mania right now happening since the Russian-Ukraine war. Uh, we know that AVAV, Aerovironment, was being used for drones uh, for Russia, Russian military, uh, for, for Ukraine's military. So U.S. has been ordering a lot of drones from AVAV to help Ukraine fight Russia. So you can see that movement from about $60, 57 all the way to 99 we don't see any time uh, any drops here. In fact, from AVAV, this has been already tri trickling to other drones companies. We've seen UAVS last night rally 25% um, as the market is speculating, um, rightly or wrongly, that there will be more drones being deployed towards um, the, the war zones. So more wars equals more, more, more drones, more deaths. Okay, so UAVS has been rising. We're also seeing the continued strength of cybersecurity names like Palo Alto Networks hitting all-time highs. We know that the largest cybersecurity stocks are still being bought and propped up by the market, no matter how highly valued, because obviously they view any dips as, uh, as countries um, protecting themselves towards potential cyber hackers, etc. Last night, I, uh, actually this day, I just saw that um, an anonymous hacker just revealed that they actually already have hacked Russian Central Bank if ever the U.S. wanted to do something about it. So I don't know what's going to continue to happen, but uh, being just keeping you abreast with news, um, the cyber guerrilla warfares are true, true, and we're seeing that outperformance in Palo Alto Networks. Um, Cloudflare is getting some outperformance here. Uh, you're seeing that one, two, two breakout Meaning, while there are some sellers at 122, I do believe that any dips of Cloudflare are still being bought. We've seen that higher lows here at $90. Same thing for CrowdStrike, uh, very strong earnings. And um, of course, we do believe that with continuous uh, difficult, um, you know, difficulty of most companies to avoid hackers, more and more companies are deploying almost all of their spending towards CrowdStrike. Uh, same thing happening towards um, Palo Alto Networks, Fortnet. Uh, Zscaler actually is a potential buys here. Um, while this one hasn't gone up to break out, I do believe that Zscaler would also be on an uptrend soon because of all these uh, dilemmas happening uh, on uh, on the on the world. So most of the counter um, cybersecurity names, in my view, are gonna go up. Up, Zscaler will go up. Sentinel One has also been uh, going up, starting to uptrend because of this ongoing war. So yeah, umangat, you can clearly see. So my view is that HACK, aka the cybersecurity ETF, is uh, really in an uptrend. So there are companies, or there at least there are sectors, in my view, 
that have already seen the bottom, uh, specifically war spend winners. Um, cybersecurity is a war spend winner. I also believe that clean energy is a cyber secure, uh, is a war spend winner. Um, all of the Raytheons, uh, all the missiles as well. So this is Raytheon technology hitting all time highs. We talked about satellite communications benefiting because of the war spend winners. And so far we have been correct about that. GSAT, which is even a small cap has been rising. GSAT, AVAV has been rising. App Harvest has been rising. Um, ASTS, which is a space mobile helping SpaceX for Ukraine has also been going up because of that. So I believe that 5G communications are, uh, are uh, especially in satellite space, are getting getting further love. Um, I'm not yet sure about the, the, the potential of uh, U.S. manufacturing bases relying a lot of 3D printing. But let me discuss what I'm seeing on MarkForged here. So far, um, since March, we are seeing some rallies on 3D printing stocks. Is it possible that people, especially in America, are rethinking to put their manufacturing bases in um, America which will make um, some 3D printing stocks go up, specifically Mark Forge going up, desktop metal also going up. So you're seeing that um, that looking to be a potential uh, beneficiary of this uh, end of globalization. Desktop metal, um, seeing some rallies on uh, nano dimension here. So you're seeing, in my view, some people speculating that 3D printing and vertical farming are sustainable solutions to this um, war. We have yet to know, so I would have viewed that uh, there might be dips, but uh, if nano dimension starts exhibiting higher lows here, if the sub metal starts showing to me higher lows here, about $4, just as what I'm seeing with a harvest, some potential higher lows here, about 4 to 5 I would view that the these sectors are already long side. Um, and with an ongoing war in Cold War era, I would also have to say that all the Chinese rallies are going to be shorted by the U.S., so um, FUTU has been um, showing us uh, that rally from 20 to 40. I view that going down, perhaps breaking $20 or retesting that. The big, uh, the big shorts would still be uh, concentrated towards China, consumer discretionary. Um, but with China rallying quite uh, significantly over the last few days, um, concentrate or prioritize shorting China. So uh, FUTU would be a short, Pinto Atua would be a short. Um, this one already is a short phase here since uh, 55. I view that uh, this will continue to fall. So the big short would be the Chinese names. Um, so I would prioritize these names. Chinese names would be good shorts. Expand Neoli Auto. Um, casinos would also be shorted. So in case uh, you wanted to short them, I, I haven't been checking uh, casinos, but yeah, Melco will be shorted. Uh, this would be a good short. Melco would be shorts. Um, just like Sans China, uh, 1928, 1928, Sans China. So I, I don't think that there is a recovery at any time soon, especially on Macau casinos. So um, especially consumer discretionary related items. So I'm a short on all of them. Okay. So um, if there's any questions, we continue to remain short. Um, and we view any rallies of the market as a technical bounce. Um, yeah. So that's how we are